Thanks for the uh, intro, John. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, OSINT for everyone, uh, understanding risks and protecting your data. Um, feel free to snap pics of the, any of the links or anything in here, uh, but if you miss one, there's a website at the end that'll have a list of all the resources, uh, anything that we referenced during the talk. Um, not a highly, highly technical talk today, uh, more of a discussion on how, how, wide, how widely used OSINT is, um, but there'll be enough uh, rabbit holes and everything to dig into that should be pretty fun for everybody. So, who am I? Um, besides uh, Kumbaya and all that good stuff, uh, I'm a private investigator. Um, I do digital, digital forensics uh, for a PI firm in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I also do um, the information security community. I try to do them right by doing conference talks like this, um, as well as co-organizing uh, our local meetup in Columbia called Colasec. Uh, I do blogging um, a lot about OSINT stuff, a little bit of digital forensics. Um, you can find that at learnallthethings.net, and that's my Twitter handle um, if you do the Twitter thing at Babelf88. This is my uh, co-creator for this talk. Uh, he is not here, unfortunately, uh, but I want to leave his slide up here. He is a uh, pretty standout guy in the InfoSec community, so uh, definitely uh, pay attention to him. Um, if you're into OSINT uh, one bit or even just information security in general, um, he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, unfortunately, uh, just a few days before his brand new SEC 487 uh, OSINT class uh, that he wrote for SANS, uh, he broke his foot, so he's not making the trip here. Um, we've packaged him in a human hamster bubble um, before his next uh, class, that way he can uh, stay nice and safe. All right, so uh, typical what is OSINT um, slide that we have at the beginning of all these. Um, OSINT is open source intelligence. Um, it is basically anything that is fair game and free information um, on the internet. Um, the contents that we see there can include uh, media, um, audio, video, geographic locations, um, text from documents, uh, blog posts, talks, um, basically anything that you find on the uh, internet um, as well as off the internet. Um, there are public records, court documents you can get your hands on, um, information at the library, uh, a sign at the front of a uh, storefront, basically anything that, that's within reach uh, for free, um, you can consider it under OSINT. Uh, social media gets pulled a lot into that. Uh, Sockment, you'll see it called sometimes. Uh, in general, um, we're just going to be using um, the OSINT designation for most of this talk. Now, OSINT is a uh, Really, data is just data uh, until you analyze it. Basically, anybody can Google a topic, um, you know, throw it in Google search or DuckDuckGo um, and get, you know, a couple pages of uh, results. Um, that's the easy part, finding information. There's so much of it out there that, you know, it's not really hard to, to go and find some info on a particular topic. Um, the hard part is producing intelligence out of it. Um, you know, there's so much information online and so widely used um, that that can actually become a little bit of a challenge to verify things. Um, our, our era of you know fake news and disinformation that, that we see out there can definitely cause a, a little bit of work when you get to the analysis portion of that. Now the professional um, methodology um, that you'll see if you're doing OSINT um, in the professional environment, um, this, this OSINT cycle um, comes up. This is a, more of a simplified one. Um, but you're doing OSINT number one uh, for a reason. You know what are your data requirements? You know why are we why are we digging this information up uh, to begin with? Um, once you have a, a target subject, um, you know what you're trying to, to find information out about, then you start the retrieval process. Dig up as much information as you can from as many sources uh, that are in play, um, and start to comb through it. You know that's your analysis portion. And then we start, uh, again, creating intelligence out of that information uh, by sifting through the, the good and the bad, um, sorting it out. If you've got multiple subjects, um, you say you're looking at uh, Josh Huff and, and there's you know 42 of them in the US, you gotta start narrowing down um, so you can pivot into the other attached information um, that is accurate to your, your target of research. When I say pivot, I'll go through a couple of uh, real world examples of data pivoting here. A uh, little what do you see exercise first. You may remember this photo um, from when the uh, false ballistic missile warning came across and scared the bejesus out of everybody in Hawaii. Um, 
this uh, photo popped up and everybody immediately started playing the game of, oh, these clowns have passwords you know, taped to their monitors and um, everybody kind of started playing the game online as well. Um, one Twitter user tried to, to find things that, that would help, you know, what would be interesting to an attacker? Um, you know, what's the, the threat intel we can get out of this photo on this facility? Um, and there, there was obvious things like the camera placement and everything. Um, but as people started digging, they found like the high resolution versions of, of this photo on certain uh, news websites and stuff. And they were able to actually pull the phone numbers off of those uh, papers on the wall, um, showing uh, basically chain of command at the facility, um, specific names and phone numbers. Um, even in the system tray, you could see icons for uh, different programs, the antivirus that the systems had on them. Uh, one person even went into the uh, the books on the, the desktop um, showing college courses, uh, saying that maybe somebody on the administration there was a college student. Um, so there was a lot of uh, information that, that you could kind of pull um, just by playing the, the what can you see game here. Another uh, pivoting example, um, this is one that, that popped up just in my, my random like local news feed of a manhunt that was going on in uh, Aiken, South Carolina. Um, I don't know about you, but if, if I get the breaking news that something's going on maybe in my backyard, you know, I like to make sure that it's not you know, in my backyard. Uh, so we started pulling up information uh, to, to try to drill in. Um, the reporter on the scene was given the county but not the exact location. Uh, so we started pulling into the, the photo a little bit as best we could. Uh, one thing I've realized during uh, tracking live events, uh, going into Google Maps and turn on your traffic layer in the general area, sometimes it'll cough up uh, a traffic jam, um, pinpoint a, a better area to, to dig into there. Um, so definitely use the traffic layer um, if, you're, if you're doing the, uh, the browser-based OSINT through Google Maps, it's uh, pretty, pretty handy. And then we could start pivoting into to real um, context. Um, a unique signpost uh, visible in red there, um, and then the uh, portion of the uh, street sign uh, visible in the the reporter's information in yellow, uh, as well as a uh, like a particular branch formation was up in the tree. Um, I believe the the photo was from like 2012. Um, the story was from like 2016, but you know all the markers were there still. So you're able to pull the the exact pivot from a geographic location based on objects in a photograph. So that's some examples of pivoting. Um, we'll back up just a little bit and, and go back into the broader spectrum. How do people use open source intelligence? There's a lot of uh, different uses for it. Um, it could be as simple as you know, parents, spouses, uh, partners using it to check on the background of a babysitter. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be some some high level investigation going on. If you just need to to look up, you know, is your neighborhood safe? Do you have sexual predators in the area? There's websites for that. Um, you can do remote location reconnaissance before you go on a vacation. You know, everybody pretty much has done that. Jumped on TripAdvisor, uh, pulled up a Google uh, Street View, and, and see you know where what's your hotel close to? Um, is there a giant biker conference going on at the same time? Uh, <laughs> And then you get into the more personal side. Um, you know, it, relationships, uh, we're in the, the age of uh, Tinder and online dating. Um, so you can start digging in and, and seeing, you know, who, who you might be going on a date with. You know, what's, what's their background? You know, what, what are they into? Um, and then from the other side of relationships, when things are going bad, you can start pulling stuff together. Uh, being a private investigator, we get to see a lot of that side of things. Um, the, the OSINT that a suspecting spouse has already done on their, their partner before they come in for a consultation is immense. Um, they, they will give you the, the Facebook profile of everybody under the sun that, that might be, you know, of suspect there. So, you know, that's the, um, the personal side of OSINT that pretty much anybody can do, whether they know it's, it's OSINT or not. Um, obviously, businesses will use it. Um, you can do um, rival intelligence, see what, you know, your rival company may be working on. Um, if you're hiring, um, you can go in and do the background stuff the same way that you can on the personal side uh, before you hire somebody. Uh, make sure that they're not some crazy hacker posting stuff when they're going nuts at CarolinaCon. Um, you can look for malicious insiders, somebody that, that's being uh, negative online about their company. Uh, you may want to keep tabs on them from a uh, security standpoint. Um, again, businesses are going to look at that stuff going into mergers and acquisitions, do their due diligence. Um, Investigations for fraud, you know, if somebody's claiming insurance fraud, we definitely go and check their social media and make sure that they're not outplaying 
you know, basketball on their, their, uh, Instagram page, um, when they're, they're claiming, you know, that they, they're getting disability checks. Um, and then legal support, uh, intellectual property, um, attorneys, uh, will use that. You can also access, um, uh, public records and, and, you know, patents and all that kind of stuff online. So definitely a, a lot to do for uh, business. Uh, again, in the current age, um, including our, our, you know, government administration, uh, media entities are using um, OSINT uh, quite a lot. Um, instant reporting of, of events um, is a constant thing. Um, researching stories, doing fact checking. Um, last night when the, the strike got initiated on Syria, there was all sorts of uh, reports flying in um, from overseas that people were, were clinging to, to to figure out what was going on. Um, that's that's a good and a bad thing. You know, the both sides of, of that conflict are going to use that social media to to sway. You know, what's what's going on? Who's who's on the good side? Who's on the bad side? So again, we've got to uh, dig into that with uh, analysis and verification um, to really pull intelligence out of that. But so much of that is out there in the media that, that there's no uh, no lack of data for that stuff either. Law enforcement absolutely uses uh, OSINT data. Um, how often do you see a, a Crime Stoppers bulletin of, of some idiot trying to knock over a, a gas station or you know, uh, footage of a, a high-speed chase and they're trying to find out who the driver of a vehicle is? Um, we just recently had uh, something going on in Columbia where somebody was holed up in their, their vehicle um, resisting arrest and it turned into a big media spectacle. There was literally people like a quarter mile away on the highway uh, on an embankment, um, putting stuff on Snap, Snapchat um, while the police were trying to, you know, defuse the situation. Um, so there, there's no lack of uh, evidence there. Uh, law enforcement uses social social media quite a bit um, in OSINT. Um, we've even seen comment threads where the, the police are, are looking for somebody and the suspect or, you know, one of their friends jumps on. You know, Bob knocked over the, the liquor store um, and their buddy gets on and says, Idiot Bob is, you know, two bars over on, on Main Street, go get him. And, you know, the next thing you know, you're getting an arrest bulletin on Bob. Intelligence agencies um, absolutely using uh, OSINT. Um, again, last night's uh, political um, maneuver with the, the strike on Syria. Um, people were watching what the other uh, troops were doing um, and, and positioning, you know, what was happening due to those actions. Um, we keep tabs on terrorist networks, um, attribution of uh, events uh, in the cyber world, um, as well as the real world. Um, basically, anything you can do to gain intel from far away. Um, recruitment of assets is, a, is an interesting one. Um, if you are trying to get a get power over a person in a particular region, you may dig up dirt on them and see if you can turn them into an asset for you. Um, Ashley Madison database is a, a perfect example of that. We saw a decent amount of extortion and, and you know, people trying to uh, pull money at the threat of, of disclosing, you know, the fact that these people were in the Ashley Madison database a couple years back. That'll lead us into OSINT for bad, basically. Um, you know, you can use that for um, pretext and cyber attacks. Obviously, uh, anybody that, that is on red team engagements are gonna know about trying to dig up information for a phishing attack. Um, we've seen uh, theft examples, uh, high profile, like the Kim Kardashian robbery. Um, she was showing off too much jewelry and location uh, presence, and somebody used that to, uh, to pull a heist and you know, got away with some pretty uh, exorbitant amounts of uh, jewelry. Um, again, extortion with things like the Ashley Madison database. If you have data that's out there, um, maybe on you know dating sites or, or even um, if you can get your, your logins tied to like escort services and things like that, then people are able to, to kind of pull um, that information to, to their advantage to use against you. Um, so there, there's plenty of examples out there in, in using OSINT for bad. Try to bring it back to a more positive light. Um, Online data that you have control over, um, things that you can do to, to you know, kind of protect yourself in essence. Um, what you share online, uh, obviously social media is a huge part of this. Um, you can dig into those settings and, and try to uh, um, keep your accounts a, as private or, or as open as you want. Um, there's, there's things online like uh, reviews uh, for restaurants and things like that. Um, those 
last a really long time. I, I, I'll look up certain targets and find out, you know, where their favorite restaurant was like seven or eight years ago because they, you know, went on Yelp and were dropping reviews left and right. Um, again, connections between uh, your various accounts, uh, fitness data, all that kind of stuff um, is, is all out there. We'll dig into a few of those more in depth. Um, things you can control, broadcasting your location. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, SnapMap uh, during the, uh, the police uh, situation in Columbia. Um, I've, I've seen people using it uh, to their advantage uh, during emergency situations. Um, the picture here was a, a large apartment fire in New York City, uh, and people were broadcasting, you know, hey, I'm out, I'm safe, you know, trying to let loved ones know. Um, and that can be beneficial. Obviously, if we want to keep tabs on, on the people we care about in a bad situation, um, as well as, you know, if, if we're in that area, we, we know to, you know, take a different route um, to get home because um, obviously the, like we saw before, traffic will be impacted there. Uh, and there may be dangerous uh, activity as well. Um, on the left there, you've got a, a, a view of Snapchat's uh, map functionality. Um, the way that works, basically anybody that has posted a uh, open post within the last 24 hours um, gets uh, put on a heat map for you. Very convenient to, to navigate. Um, and on the right is the uh, Facebook Live map. Um, that one is uh, more of a, a beacon. Um, if there's a user live with a video, um, they'll show up as a blue dot. Um, I use it enough that I, I've noticed a few things um, that I'll share here. Um, this is an example of somebody broadcasting their location just to entertain. They're driving around. Um, how, how common is it now to, to see somebody walking down the street like this having a, a combo with themselves? Um, they're either FaceTiming or they're, they're broadcasting live on one of these apps. Um, these uh, two ladies in this video were just kind of driving around talking to their friends. You know, there was comments, you know, coming, coming back online um, and they were just having a good old time. Uh, in the about section of their profile, it says that they're located in Tampa, Florida. Um, the dots from the previous slide showed that that's where it was. You could actually overlay it um, and see that, yeah, the dot is present near Tampa, Florida. Um, but if you started digging into the, the video a little bit, um, audio cues, I heard the word Catania mentioned. Um, so I, I pulled up a, a street view and, and, and did some analysis. You know, one of the signs I was able to track down, uh, zoom in a little bit, and it's actually a, a pharmacy um, with the phone number built in. So we're able to validate that they're not actually in Tampa, Florida, but they were in Catania, Puerto Rico uh, for that video. So little subtleties there. Um, but again, this person is, is choosing to broadcast location uh, in a way that we can detect um, in this, for this uh, purpose was to entertain. Um, tying your accounts together, that's something that you have control over. Um, if you're gonna generate an, an online persona for yourself, um, it could be personal, it could be for, for business, um, and you get in really into OSINT, it can be for deception and, and OPSEC, but um, on the left, you've got a, a TV reporter using it, um, and they've got their network spelled right out. You know, There's their LinkedIn, there's their Instagram, um, there's their Twitter. Um, they're all in one easy spot. As an OSINT investigator, that's perfect. We love that, because then we can just go down the list and pull every piece of intel we can. Um, sites like Keybase will have uh, users that also identify, you know, these are my official accounts on all these platforms. Um, so we, we are able to choose whether or not we tie our accounts together openly like that. Fitness data. Um, the amount of information that we share um, obviously came into play uh, several months back with the, the Strava uh, data that, that got put out. Um, when me and Micah put this talk together, we weren't trying to get everybody to, to not share this information. Um, there's definitely benefits to um, using this kind of thing if you're into that. Um, connecting with friends and doing like challenges and stuff, probably like eight years or, or more. I, I used to do Nike Plus like a ton. Um, put the sensor in my iPod, um, go out for a run, get the miles logged in my, my profile. Um, and with my friends, we'd do like challenges like by month. So um, towards the end of the month, I remember getting, getting out for maybe like a quick five mile run. And as I logged in, I can see that my buddy Doug had just dropped like 10 miles the day before, took me out of first place for the month. So you know what, screw you, Doug. I ran for like 14 miles that night. Was I planning on it? No. <laughs> the next day he's like, what kind of idiot goes and runs 14 miles just to beat me on this challenge? I was like, I don't know. It's the, the kind of idiot I am, I guess. So, anyway, screw you, Doug. I'm on. Um, but the uh, the point of that is, 
that kind of stuff can be fun. You know, we're not saying don't have fun with that kind of technology, um, but be careful with it. Um, Strava was the perfect example because it was so widely used. There's millions of users uh, on it, and it goes back uh, many years. Um, Micah did a decent amount of research on, on this portion. Uh, I'll go through it kind of quickly, but he uh, basically, they, they tried to strip away the data and post all these runs in the version of a heat map that you could just turn on, and obviously the map is hotter when there's more and more of these paths there. Um, what he did was start digging in, and you could undo the uh, anonymity of the, the data that they put out there. He actually was doing talks on this back in 2014 and 15, um, and one of the things that he noticed were, in one particular area, people were calling their runs patrols. Um, so he started digging into it, and it was actually a, a sub-power station um, in Tilbury, UK, I think. And what, when he dug in, he found out that they were, the guards were actually using Strava um, almost as accountability. The company was having the guards use these things on their patrols. You know, maybe they, they had issues where guards were sitting in front of the desk too long and not taking their routes, so have this fitness tracker on you, and we'll, we'll keep tabs on that. Um, Back then, the, the data was pretty much, you know, by user, um, little run points there. Once Strava dropped the heat map thing on it, though, you could tell that there's going to be issues there. Um, the, the guards were obviously very present on the, the east and west sides of that facility, a um, little bit on the south, but there's an obvious vulnerability there. Um, if we're looking at, at a way to, to breach this, uh, this building or, you know, do some vandalism or something, um, we know where the, the live guards are going to be and where they're not. Um, the other thing that people got definitely uh, up in arms about um, was the the identification of, of other uh, base camps and stuff. Um, this example here, um, you can see in the, the top, it's 170 attempts around this base camp perimeter um, by 10 people. Um, again, in the, the sentiment of screw you, Doug, um, that they were competing. You know, there's leaderboards out there for Strava too, so people were trying to, to make that route around the base perimeter um, to be the fastest. And then again, some of these uh, profiles were, were not quite uh, private in their settings. That particular user had photos, you know, that's inside their home, pictures of them with their pets, um, and even photos of other areas that they were doing uh, activities in that you could branch out and, and kind of move to where else would they be. So that was kind of the, the summary there. If you're not careful with the way that you use that, definitely we're able to identify some things. Um, Strava did go through and, and pull a little bit of the permissions back. Um, a lot of the scrutiny that we're seeing out of uh, the Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica stuff, um, as well as the, the privacy changes out of the um, European um, GDPR stuff, um, is gonna start to kind of pull some of this stuff back um, to a point, um, but it's it, never enough to, to drop you know, OSINT discoverability. All right, so again, those are things you, you obviously have control over. Um, we'll touch on some, some data that you don't necessarily have control over here. Um, there is all sorts of, of things in the vein of uh, public record, um, real estate information, affiliations that you may have to other groups that post their own information um, via newsletters, um, things like that. Uh, as well as like the the increasing technology on um, facial recognition, um, I I know before the Cambridge Analytica stuff, Facebook was already letting you know about the the facial recognition settings. The first time you log in, it was like, hey, we've got this great feature. Um, you can use it to to be notified when somebody is you know putting pictures of you. Um, that way, you can tag yourself or not. Um, no, thank you. Number one, um, they just are telling us about it. But if you pulled your um, archive of your data, that algorithm uh, for your face data has been in there for quite some time. Um, it's not really a new thing. They've been harvesting that for quite a while. Um, there's articles out there like this one that, that talk about kind of the ghost profiles. You may not necessarily have a Facebook account, um, or you may have chosen to, to delete it after some of the outrage, uh, but they're still kind of giving you that ghost profile. That way, if you do happen to join, um, or if your friend tags you and, and you do want to take part in that, that facial recognition, there's going to be a database out there for you. 
Um, we're seeing more and more cities that have quite a bit of this technology as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. I, I discovered, you know, there was a ghost profile for me, even though I already had a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. Apparently someone just spelled my name differently and so it created this second Facebook, you know, and, and suddenly I was like, you want to be friends with this and I'm like, that's that's crazy. Right. <laughs> and it took me a while to figure that out. So, you know, uh they've been doing that for each second. Yeah. They uh and so data and storing it. Probably even even if you link your account. Yep. So. Oh yeah, your your account's gone, but they'll they'll keep Keep something there for you, you know, just in case you want to go back. Um, Facebook's been around since 2004, so that's plenty of time for them to develop this and, and you know have plenty of archive stuff back there. Um, I've seen that facial um, algorithm stuff kind of backfire at the same time. Um, instances where parents are tagging their kids um, for each other. That way, if somebody likes a photo that's the family, the other parent gets notified, you know, when the grandparents are seeing a picture of, you know, grandson, for instance. Um, but the algorithm, if you're doing that over and over again, starts to actually mix the the faces just a little bit. So I've I've seen a little bit of deception there too. That I wonder how how that stuff will pan out in the long run too. But time will tell on that one. Uh, religious newsletters uh, is one thing that, that Micah was able to do a, a pretty good amount of information digging on. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more, but there, there's a lot of information in any organization's newsletter, um, all the way to like contact entries, um, who's sick, who's having kids, um, pictures, uh, future events where you may be able to determine that somebody's going to be somewhere in the future. Um, newsletters are a great source for that. <laughs> Um, he was able to pull a um, Google dork there um, with the file type PDF, um, the term newsletter, and then church, temple, synagogue, or mosque. Um, and you can see here he's got almost 700,000 uh, results, um, which are all, all almost you know full PDF newsletters. Um, once you start kicking through those guys, um, Grace Lutheran there on the right, they've got a, a, an archive that I think went back about 10 years once he, he found that directory. Um, and then you, you've got basically just archives of, of different um, data points. Uh, this was the prayer chain, you know, uh, phone numbers and, and email addresses for the, the congregation, um, birthdays going on there, um, prayers for the healing, people that are sick, you know, full photographs of, of new members. Um, so you can get your reverse image search on if one of those people happens to be a target. So quite a bit of information in, in newsletters and the religious examples. Um, religion's not the only spot where you'll find newsletters. There's business news newsletters and, and plenty of other venues out there for that kind of thing as well. Uh, real estate property. Um, public records are, are out there for a lot of uh, real estate. Um, if you go to a, a website like uh, Zillow.com shown here, um, they're going to aggregate that as much of that as possible and put it out there as a convenience for somebody that may be looking to, to buy a home, um, get some intel on the worth of the neighborhood that they're walking into. Um, this particular example gets uh, pretty, pretty bad though. Um, this property was hosted by Turner Properties, which is actually a rental company. Um, they have a YouTube channel for those kind of properties with uh, videos like this. This is about a seven minute um, tour uh, of that particular house um, going all the way around the yard um, to the back doors, the side doors, um, and then they go into the property and show you, you know, each of the rooms. Uh, that photo on the bottom right is the front door, um, and that panel on the right-hand side is the alarm panel, um, things that you might not necessarily want somebody to know uh, the location of uh, in your home. Um, once I, I found that kind of information, um, you're actually able to, to do um, the street view exploration. Um, and there's houses with the same floor plan in, in your neighborhoods. Um, I did a, a walk and was able to find a kind of a unique uh, rooftop pattern. And at that point, I zoomed out and was able to actually find like 11 identical houses uh, that match that you know seven minute tutorial walkthrough. So you know if if I'm a a thief trying to to case a joint, um, I've got actually 11 different options in that neighborhood because of that that one rental property. So. Uh, things like that you got to be careful of, you know, if somebody in your neighborhood um, is, you know, 
their house property is on a rental, you may have a lot more information about you know your home layout. So you want to be careful of that kind of stuff too. Um, that's kind of uh, the end of the bad stuff there. We'll make it a little bit more fun with uh, interesting OSINT here. There is a lot of tracking sites out there. Um, track a train, planes, boats, satellites, um, much more. I think I found the um, UFO sightings tracker. Um, somebody was was following the um, the gritters uh, out of Ireland uh, that that dropped all the the salt on the the highways. Um, and they they had like some crazy names like uh, Gritalica and. Um, uh, gritty gritty bang bang and stuff like that. So people were putting those out there You could see the locations of the salt trucks uh, over in Europe uh, So there, there's a lot of that kind of stuff out there that makes OSINT uh, fun uh, the, the most I think uh, Useful ones uh, from a general standpoint are, are some of the flight tracking ones. Um, you can see if your your flights are, are on time um, I was able to kind of wave at that plane as it's, it's mid-route um, going from Washington to, to Orlando coming across Columbia there um, you can also see interesting things like holding patterns. Um, if you got planes that are just kind of circling your city, um, might be cause for alarm. You kind of look it up um, and realize that these guys are all in a holding pattern while that storm front um, passes through because um, they're not trying to land at the, the airport with a storm over it. Uh, and then uh, again, last night with the, the Syria strikes, uh, people were watching on flight radar. Um, this was like a Russian uh, military jet. Um, that pulled a UE during the amount of, of uh, some of the, the strikes. So uh, obviously people are, are going to pay attention to that kind of intelligence too. Um, the marine tracker ones uh, can, can key into some of that military stuff too. There was some unique um, tracking going on last night for sure. Another interesting one is the, uh, the amount of uh, remote traffic cameras in the major cities. Um, this one was uh, Atlanta. Um, Obvious use case there is to avoid the terrible traffic jam on the right there. Um, the, the other pretty solid uses would be uh, for law enforcement, um, things like Amber Alerts or you know, stolen vehicles. Um, you're gonna be able to, to utilize these network of cameras all over the city to, to maybe keep tabs on a, a vehicle um, that's cruising around. Um, I've been able to take part in cases uh, involving like heavy equipment theft um, and being able to, to tune into camera networks like this as somebody's moving, say like a, uh, flatbed with a giant piece of construction equipment on the back is, is pretty useful. Um, you'd be able to, to keep tabs on, on which direction things are, are moving. I found that stuff useful enough. I actually set up a, a small GitHub list. Um, South Carolina, I think I'm up to about four or 500 um, different camera locations. Um, I was able to, to pull that and with some of these listings, you can even get like the GPS coordinates off of the, the back end if you pull like the, the JSON view on these sites, so um, I'll try to, I'll be slowly updating this. If you wanna mark that GitHub page, I'll, I'll have a whole bunch of cameras for you. Um, I started aggregating some of DC um, and a little bit of uh, Georgia as well. All right, so what can we do to make, uh, make it more challenging for people um, against using you know, our own data against us? You know, the, the internet itself is basically just a, a personal risk-based decision. You know, how much information do you want to give up to have access to certain services? Um, this Join Honey website has been heavily advertised recently, um, and it's a uh, coupon aggregator. Um, you join the program, give them um, permission to kind of see where you're shopping, um, and it does that along the other 600 plus million people that are doing it. Um, and you have access to coupon codes when you go to check out on a website, you know, hey, you're, you're shopping at, you know, Overstock, here's a 10 off 100 coupon. Um, but if you go into those privacy terms, you can tell that they're, they're just tracking everything under the sun with your web traffic. Um, so that's a decision, you know, whether or not you're going to, you know, give up that information to, to have the, um, the benefit of those coupon codes. Um, you you want to definitely be aware of that. The items that are already on the internet, um, the opt-out uh, policy that's in place on a lot of the people search sites. Um, this document, um, Micah's uh, coworker put together, it's a, a really handy one that hits a lot of the major uh, people search sites. 
Um, some of those sites are pretty easy to opt out of and you can just go to a link, you know, find your entry and drop it. Other ones, not so much, but they kind of give you the, the listing of, you know, which ones are, are easy, which ones are difficult. Um, and they've, they've done some work to kind of keep this updated because um, people search sites, uh, they change, they shift, um, they, they rebrand. Um, so it, it's not an easy thing to do, but um, using a resource like this will definitely help you play the game of, of keeping your information off of the easy uh, targets out there. Um, educating others, um, your own privacy practices uh, may not necessarily be the same as your family and friends. Um, if, if I'm gonna go and have a beer with uh, Micah and he's gonna be tagging it on uh, untapped or, you know, Foursquare that, you know, hey, I'm having a beer with Beowulf, like, you know, uh, just let people know, you know, I, I, I value my privacy, please don't, you know, put this stuff, you know, out while we're, we're doing that kind of stuff. Um, because again, your, your intentions and, and practices may not necessarily be that of your friends and family. Um, so their decisions on, on risk and, and having fun with social media and stuff can definitely impact you, um, similar to the, the ghost profile stuff. Um, and then uh, your kids, I've, I've, I've got a son and he, he uses a few of my accounts through like the gaming sites and stuff, so I have to keep tabs on that. You know, I don't, I don't need um, anything in my information security realm bubbling over to the, the, the gaming realm, you know, so we try to isolate the, the usernames and stuff like that um, and definitely keep, uh, keep tabs on, on the kids too. Uh, persistence is key when it comes to educating your family. Um, obviously we're going through a lot with the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica stuff. Um, and a lot of people are just like, you know, why, why aren't they more informative to this stuff? You know, they, they say that they're slimy and sneaky and all this stuff, but I mean, this one, was an article from 2015 um, saying, hey, these quizzes are not good for your privacy, you know, don't use them. Um, there was another one from two years ago, um, stop doing quizzes on Facebook if you have any value on privacy. And then four days ago, you know, data collected by quiz app in, in private, you know, included your private messages. It's just the awareness, it's not a one and done thing. So you may have to tell your family members a bunch of times. Um, so that, that kind of stuff is, is definitely a, a persistence pays off type of thing. And we mentioned this one before, but consider not tying your accounts together. Um, that by far is one of the easiest ways to, to go and, and start uh, branching an OSINT profile on somebody if they've got linked accounts. Um, we've got ways to, to kind of pivot off of, of those. Um, but when you put them all in one spot for us, it definitely makes it easy to, to get started. Uh, Micah did build the uh, SEC 487 class. Um, his next one is in June. Um, the link there will give you more information on that. He's done a really good job with that. Um, definitely check it out. And then I've got a lot of my blog material up um, discussing more OSINT tools and, and tactics and everything. Um, that's going to be the final link where I'll drop all the, the links and resources if you missed one. Um, so that would be the, the one there. Uh, that's all the prattling I have for today. Anybody got any questions or anything? Yes. Um, impersonation, um, when it comes to uh, social media and profiles, that definitely has come into play. Um, in private investigation, I, I've got people that'll come in with um, cyber stalking and harassment type cases, um, and you will find multiple profiles sometimes for people in those situations. Um, when it comes to things like Facebook, I've, I've been able to do a lot of uh, research on the Facebook ID number uh, to the point where I can almost go back and, and timestamp it based on the Facebook ID number alone. Um, so in a case where you've got, say, five profiles for the same person, you can go back, find the oldest one, and, you know, kind of authenticate off of that one. Um, I've also seen other scenarios where, um, say, people are using Facebook for gang affiliations or, or something more underhanded. They'll have multiple profiles, um, and they may be connected to their family and, and everything on one of them, and then all of their, their friends and everything for, the, you know, the gang relations stuff on the other one. Um, so 
basically doing as much uh, back end research as you can to, to validate you know via the the ID numbers or are going through and, and actually looking at the uh, the timelining of stuff is, is kind of the best way I've seen to, to be able to do that um, you can do some sites make it easier than others um, if you've got Twitter accounts you can literally just hover over their a part in their profile and it pops up you know they joined on this day at this time like it, it shows it right there um, there's tools out there um, that'll help you um, timestamp do that and do some of that analysis. Um, the the ones on uh, IntelTechniques.com are, are some of the best ones for for kind of digging into the Facebook APIs. Um, but it's it's doing things on the back end of of the websites to kind of pull that information for you. Um, we're in a kind of a uh, fluctuation right now because of the Cambridge Analytica stuff they're they're dropping access to a lot of those API's um, but I'll, I'll make sure and drop the link to uh, some of the Facebook tools um, on that final um, final set there if, if you're interested in that just kind of take a look there yep. yes so when you say link Yeah, the um, the Facebook analytics, um, signing in with Facebook, signing in with Google, um, that's one of those things that will will start to link in your, your overall digital profile. Um, a lot of people will just straight up put it in their profile, you know, hey, this is my Snapchat, you know, and it's in their Twitter profile, or, you know, this is my account on deviantart.com like you know there, there's blatant ways and then you know there's there's the tracking ways um, you can sign into just about anything under the sun with your Facebook profile um, and then that stuff tends to kind of leave some of those analysis trails when we start putting your Facebook um, ID number into those analysis tools um, we can see some of that stuff as a, a linked app or an authorized app on your profile so that that can definitely spin off if, if you're signing in with those buttons Yes. So have you uh, ever tried using Multigo for this and you know, the data sources that you plug into Multigo pretty expensive to you know any I don't. I don't pay for a lot of the the, the heavy Multigo lifting ones. Um, I, I know there's a lot of red teamers out there that they they've got the backing by their company to to kind of fund those and, and run run through those. But it's it's definitely a, a costly process. I know a lot of people um, more on the private investigator side or the the smaller business side that use the community edition to kind of build out their their profiles uh, visually. Um, sometimes for just for reporting purposes. Um, but I, I don't personally use a lot of the paid um, paid tools out there. There's there's not a lack of, of open source tools when it comes to this kind of stuff um, that that I've really needed to to go that level. Um, even the PI firm uses um, some of the TLO like paid database lookups on on uh, background checks for people, um, and I've I've had access to the paid side of that. I can probably pull at least 90% of that with, with open source tools. Um, it's not as fast, obviously, but you know the, the tools are out there if you know where to, to find them to, to kind of patch all those little pieces together and build the same level of uh, intelligence. All right, no other questions, I'll, uh, I'll get out of here. Thanks for your time, everybody, appreciate it. <laughs>